Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the latest edition of the Jake's Take with Jacob Ali Sharp podcast, the fifth anniversary season. I'm your host, Jacob Ali Sharp, chief content producer and writer of jakesake.com, a pop culture entertainment news website. Before we get started, if you're watching this on YouTube, please give us a thumbs up and please subscribe to my channel. If you're listening to this on our audio platforms, download this episode and other episodes, and also please give us a five-star rating. I would really appreciate it. I'm so excited to welcome my next guest today. She is a creative producer and arts advocate. She's a film credit for My KC Live that airs on KCTV5 CBS in my in our hometown of Kansas City. She's a co-creator, co-executive producer, and co-host of Get Lost, which airs on Kansas City PBS. So please help me welcome Lanita Cook to the podcast. Hello, hello. <laughs> hello, Lanita. Thank you so much for taking time and schedule to talk to me today. I really appreciate it. I am so happy to be here and happy fifth anniversary uh, to your show. This is so awesome. Thank you for having me. You are so welcome, Lanita. I'm so happy to have you. And guys, we are connected because Get Lost is also produced by one of my dear friends, our mutual dear friends, Michael Mackey. M2, he's the host with the most. <laughs> Absolutely. He is probably one, of, probably one of the best media personalities of all time. He's awesome. Absolutely. I, I, my, my favorite word that I hear people say about him is that he's a hoot. That is like the most uh, common word. He's a hoot. And I would agree. He's a hoot, but he's, uh, um, I don't know if you want to talk about Michael at all, but he's also uh, very tender. Uh, he takes great care of people. Uh, he's super smart, super funny, all the things. So yeah, yeah. Absolutely, my, thank, that's your, your shout out, Michael. Uh, and thank you so much. And hopefully one of these days we'll do a, th a podcast with the three of us. So anyway, we're here to talk about you, Lanita. So let's get started. So when you get interested in media and how did that desire evolve into desire to pursue a career in the entertainment industry? Oh, now that's a big question. I'm going to have to give you the, uh, since I was little um, answer, um, it has to definitely do with the kinds of movies that I was watching. You know, I, like a lot of people, consider the late 70s into the 80s um, the Hollywood Renaissance. And so I'm like, yes to all the movies that came out in my childhood. But then there were movies like All That Jazz and Fame and Fast Forward. A lot of people don't know Fast Forward, but it was one of those that I watched on repeat. And so all of these movies that um, were about performance, about being young, about moving to New York, <laughs> those sorts of things. Um, and, and I like the other stuff too, like your diehards and your Beetlejuices and all those great 80s staples. But the kinds of movies that got me interested in arts and performing were those like Break In, B Street, like all of these kinds of movies. And so, yeah, the, I would say that was the beginning. But then my best friend growing up, who is one year and two days older than me is my first cousin Latifa, and she would come over my house every weekend, or I'd go over there. Um, so we were together every weekend, and she and I we would we we shared imaginary friends, um, and then we would also perform these little skits and sketches at at home. And so this is just one of the ways that we entertained ourselves. This was like the beginning of SNL, and it was very uh, influential on how we. Uh, I mean, I don't know if they intended to be, but it was influential on how we played as kids. Yeah. That's wonderful to hear. So I grew up around the same time around, like grew up around like the, like, you know, how SNL was with you guys. It was all that for me. And it's great. And like, it's great to have like those kind of friends, like co those cousins who are extremely close. And I would get in trouble if I mention a lot of names, draw like the cousins who are watching, they know who they are. <laughs> well, I mean, I have a big, big family. Um, my mother had 11 siblings. Yeah. And so I have a ton of cousins. At one point in my life, when I was about 25, there were six generations of us alive. And so oh, I'm wow. very proud of my entire family. But my cousin Latifa, we were together every single weekend of our of our childhood. So, yeah. 
Awesome. Awesome. So we got to talk about those create because I will always love to have when there's television personalities or producers around to talk about the creators, the reporters, the anchors that inspired you and continue to inspire you to this day. Mm. But again, you asked some really good, big questions. Um, uh, I've recently answered this question and I talked about Maya Angelou. Um, I gotten to see her speak live and it was just being in the room with her. Of course, we know that she um, was an incredible speaker. Um, she had a lot of profound um, things to say and impart that I believe we hear and it changes our lives, the most of us. We, we turned her words into our personal mantras, but it was really being in her presence and being uh, sharing that space with the audience who is in her energy and in her space. Um, and so that was life-changing for me. Um, I grew up watching Oprah Winfrey. Um, I know that, you know, and I, I acknowledged before that, um, she may not be the most popular person right now, but at one point in her career, she was, and I called her the Michael Jackson of daytime television. You know, um, nobody uh, has done what she did. And I don't think that, um, I think the world has changed so much that I don't know that there will ever be another opportunity to be as influential as uh Oprah Winfrey was um, during her talk show. And what I really appreciate and what I try to learn from now is her ability, ability to market. Um, she's a great host, as a great host, um, very smart, you know, uh, elevated literacy and uh, love of literature and all the things that she did. Um, but I really appreciate her style of marketing. This was something when we watched her show, at least for me, I didn't realize that she was marketing products and services to us. Um, this is what the, the social media influencer does, right? But we can see them doing it. I had no idea. I thought that she was just coming into our homes every day and just spending an hour with us. And we were besties, right? Like, I feel like most people that watched her um, felt that way about her. And so um, her style of marketing was very um, personal, um, very open hearted um, and, and effective in a way that I, I would like to learn more about how she accomplished that. Absolutely. We got to talk. Yeah. Oprah was phenomenal. And like, I remember back in the day when I was, I was, I mean, a couple of podcasts ago, I revealed this, that I've always said that there were three chance, like there was a TV box that I was, that I had that my parents and I used when I was like one or two and they created characters of Donahue, Sally, Jessica, Raphael, and Oprah, because they were all on channel nine. And, and it was me at the last, at the last thing, last air space. So I definitely, I definitely think Oprah does play a huge role in my thing. And it's also as one of my big three. I, for my big three, I had Barbara Walters and Regis Philbin as well, because they, along with Oprah, define daytime television of what it is, define how to inspire people and how to stay along in a lengthy, have a career that lasts decades. A career that lasts decades, but then influence, building influence that spans beyond that initial career. That This was something that I also talked about and I think is wild, is yeah, Oprah is still out here. She's got social media page. She still does her magazine and stuff. But the thing that we call the Oprah effect, it is still real. Um, and, I, and I talked about a friend of mine who has a product, she sells cookies and some of the best cookies I've ever had in my life. And when I met her, she didn't have a vegan cookie because I'm vegan. <laughs> and now she had a, a vegan cookie and she shipped some to me, the most delicious cookies I've ever had. And Oprah last year added these cookies to her, her My Favorite Things list. Yes. Oh, wow. Yes. And she said she had to come on social media multiple times and say, hey guys, I, 
I didn't understand. <laughs> you yeah, cannot right. understand what it is, but the Oprah effect is still in effect. And so when Oprah adds your product to her list today, your business becomes overwhelmed because so many people trust her. And that's what I'm really getting at is the way that she built that trust. Um, and so, yeah, it, and, and she hasn't been on air for however many years and that trust is still so strong and and so that's what i think is really i, I keep thinking the word miraculous um because i think building trust is a miracle in this world but that's just me um <laughs> i i think that having that kind of trust is just um unbelievable right that that it's maintained so long after you've stepped away from that original platform. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I, I agree a hundred percent. I got to say this. We're here to talk about you and not <laughs> Oprah. <laughs> well, I mean, this, yes, yes. I Thank you for that. But th this is a part of what I value is trust building, right? This is a huge part of what I think, um, is important to my own work as a film critic, but also um, as a writer, um, as a consultant, as an arts advocate, it is building that trust with the people that you um, have relationships with. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> I got to say this, because now that you brought it up, because you are a renowned arts advocate and you just wrapped up your service and your tenure as the first, I can't believe this, the first and black woman to to be the president of the Johnson County Arts and Heritage Museum Foundation and Friends Board, while also serving as a field consultant for the Kansas Department of Commerce Creative Arts Industries Commission. So I got to say this, kudos to you. Congratulations. I think you are, you broke that glass ceiling. <laughs> well, first, uh, let me say thank you for that. Um, I, I want to say that um, there was an internal desire to push the envelope forward, I think from the foundation from Johnson County Arts and Heritage in and of itself. Um, and my friend, um, I say friend now, I used to say mentor, but my friend and mentor, um, Larry Meeker, at the time when I joined the uh, foundation board, um, he was the president. And he and I had met um, at the Interurban Art House, and he met with me once a month for a year, uh, just getting to know me, just, you know, how do I think, what do I care about? Um, and there were some things that you know, he taught me during that year. And I think a part of what he wanted to see is, you know, do I learn stuff? And I do learn stuff. And some of the best things I've learned are from my time, um, spending time with Larry. Um, and so he asked me one day, hey, instead of getting lunch, you know, out, do you want to come over to the center? I hadn't been there since I was little. When I was little, it was King Louis. It was a bowling alley and um, ice skate rink. And um, my church, Red Circle Girls, we would go ice skating there. And I hadn't been there since it was no longer King Louis. And I said, sure, I want to, I've driven by it. I want to go in. And he gave me a tour of that entire place upstairs, the center where the arts classes are, where the theaters are and the event spaces, but then downstairs, the museum. And then at the end, he said, so uh, could you see yourself serving the board here? I said, uh, whatever you want. Yeah, I'll do it. <laughs> and so I joined the board and it was the most functional board I'd ever been a part of. It, it was all of these um, people who were so well accomplished in their personal lives and their careers, um, you know, because most of the boards that I had served on at that time were people who were still actively working in their careers and still striving to become, to, to realize their dreams. But these were mostly retirees and people who wanted to give to, to um, the community that they love. Um, and so they, 
it, it was just a very different experience and I learned so, 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 so much. And um, what Larry did, uh, he's, he's so smart. Um, what he did was um, nominated me to chair uh, the strategic planning committee. And I said, sure, I'm happy to. <laughs> I had never chaired a strategic planning committee, um, but he mm -hmm. understood that I'm a strategic thinker. I didn't understand that about myself at the time. And, and so he had me do that. And I worked with um, the, the committee, brilliant people. I have mostly listened um, and, and we came up with a strategic plan for the, the museum. And from there, when he was ready to step down uh, as president, he nominated me to take his place, which was like, really? <laughs> me? <laughs> um, and then they, they voted me as president unanimously. And um, it's some of the most rewarding work that I've been able to be a part of um, because everybody's so great. I'm a people, like a people person. Uh, I'm more personal. Like I, I want to know you personally, right? It's not just business for me. Um, and everybody is genuinely great, but then they are also uh, phenomenal people to learn from. And so this kind of um, like the kind of education that you pay thousands and thousands of dollars to get in an institution, I just get to rub shoulders with these people and learn directly from them. And, and, and so it, it just is phenomenal. And the museum, if I um, remember correctly, it was founded in 1967 and I um, was voted in as president, I believe in 2019, 20, 19. And, um, and so it was really awesome. We got a new executive director of the museum around that same time, and then COVID happened. And so, you know, getting to be president, sorry, there's a siren uh, in the background. Uh, oh, believe me, I used to do that when I went, I live in New York City, believe me, I heard the sirens <laughs> all day night in the spot with this podcast. So we, this podcast and this listeners have known for the past five years, they know sirens are in the background. They can handle it. <laughs> okay, um, and so that it, and so getting to um, helm the foundation um, during COVID with uh, uh, Mary McMurray, who is the executive, uh, current executive director, um, it was just a lot of elbow grease, a lot of being thoughtful, a lot of, you know, and it, it just was beautiful work to be able to do. Um, and then before I stepped down as president, we were able to transition our foundation into a friends group. And so being able to manage that transition, um, it just was like, I felt so cool. <laughs> like being able to be a part of that process, um, it, it just, just was amazing. Um, and then yes, simultaneously contracting with uh, Kansas Department of Commerce uh, as a field rep for Kansas Arts Commission. Um, we are, are now the Kansas Arts Commission. And um, what I do for them is just make sure that um, the program has shifted a little bit um, in the last year, but the previous years, we just make sure that our arts-based nonprofits in the state of Kansas are resource ready. Absolutely. You guys do phenomenal work because pretty soon, as as we are recording right now, whose kids are, and teachers are think are still thinking about 2024, 2025. So how important is it that the arts stay top of mind for this come for this generation? Oh wow, that's a great question. I you know, and I'm gonna speak for myself. I'm not gonna speak as representative for the state by any means. Um, but one being able to practice, have an arts practice is important. If you are an artist, and even if you're not, you know, having an outlet, I mean, there are tons of studies that, that are out there that show the correlation between active arts practice, um, whether it's a hobby or whether it's for work um, and mental well-being, um, physical well-being, um, joyousness, these sorts of things, um, alleviating loneliness, these sorts of things, uh, lots of stuff out there that you can, um, you know, engage to understand that. But for me, um, what I think 
is very important is making sure that artists, individual artists, um, ha have sustainability, um, that they can sustain not only their arts practice, but their lives and be able to sustain their lives by practicing their art. Um, as an artist myself, um, I was an actor years ago. We always had to have a, a, a second job, a day job to be able to do our work. And so for me, a part of what I wanna make sure is available is that you can do your work as an artist and live <laughs> from there. And so, um, but then also institutionally, thinking about how art it can aid in economic development um, and economic prosperity. And, and so that's, that's what I think um, the, the usefulness and function of art is and why it's important because there is a lot um, that, a lot of ways that art plays a strong and powerful role in um, the elevation of, of the economy. Absolutely, and in all honesty, without art, we don't have, we'll be just stuck with the sciences and maths, the STEM, we would just be STEMs and physical education. And I gotta say, I wouldn't miss a choir thing. As someone that's an arts kid that actually was a choir kid from fifth grade to 12th grade, did theater from sixth grade to 12th grade. So that's why the arts are always important. I always champion it. Yes. Yes. I mean, when we talk about arts and kids, like kids are not surviving childhood without arts. OK, <laughs> like I think that's a, a fair statement. Um, I think like growing up was the same for me. Like there was no choice. We did choir once a week. We did art once a week. And these were separate classes. We had our, our class and then we would go to another class and learn from our art teacher and learn from our choir teacher. And I, I think PE is great. I loved playing sports when I was a kid. I and mean, let's, let's do kickball. You know what I mean? Um, I love science. I, when I was a kid, I wanted to grow up and be a psychiatrist and, you know, um, and so very interested in medicine. And, and so, but I think it, it, we, we have to look at all of this as an ecosystem because it, one, if you let go of one, then you're letting go. Um, you're deteriorating. Is this the word diminishing the other? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. yeah. And we cannot diminish that. And we got to find ways to keep the arts in schools and keep the arts in our communities. Absolutely, absolutely. And that is oh. the core, that's the core of our work um, with the state is making sure that um, arts are a part of our daily lives. Absolutely. Um, one of the questions I would love to ask you is, before we get to get lost, I wanna to talk to you about some of your highlights that you have done in your career. So if you have any highlights that jump out of you, why do they stand out? Highlights? Yes. Um, just like in general or when it like comes memorable to- memorable interviews or memorable moments on the red carpet. Memorable interviews, gosh. Um, I, <laughs> I, uh, so there's a show on Apple TV Plus called Trying. Do you know this show? I need to look at, I need to look it up. That's okay. That's okay. So trying is on Apple TV plus. I, I, I just, they just did their third or fourth season. They just started. And it's about a UK couple um, who wanted to have a baby and are unable. And so they, um, it, they, in, in exploring their options, they decide to adopt. Um, and that's kind of the premise of the show. And I got to interview the two actors that play that couple. And um, it's a, the kind of show seasons one and two where I cried at almost every episode. Like I'm an easy crier though. Um, <laughs> and, and they uh, serenaded me in that interview. Wow. <laughs> like on the spot, I asked them, I said, um, 
you know, something about them being the masters of the heartstrings because they're pulling them uh, in all the right ways all the time. And they just made up a song called Masters of the Heartstrings right there. <laughs> <laughs> and so I love that so much. Um, and then, of course, I got to interview Jason Sudeikis. Um, that was... <laughs> um, even before Ted Lasso, I loved Jason Sudeikis. Um, my kids are like, um, because, you know, we all have our comfort stuff that we put on the TV and it's, we are the Millers, horrible bosses, horrible bosses too. Um, I, not so much stuff like Kodachrome, because for me, that's like a real sit down. Um, I'm going to be crying in the middle of this thing at the end of this thing. But you know, something where, you know, I need to just, um, you know, relax or I need a palate cleanser because I've had like a tough day. It's Jason Sudeikis all the way. Um, and so uh, Ted Lasso season one um, replaced the Golden Girls as my all time favorite series. Oh, and wow. Yes, I love Ted Lasso season one so much. I probably watched that entire uh, season, I don't know, probably 200 times. I love it so much. And when I talk to people, um, work with writers uh, about economical storytelling, season one of Ted Lasso is my go-to for that. And so being able to interview Jason himself, <laughs> it was like, <laughs> it was bonkers bananas. Um, but yeah, yeah, so that was, that was cool. Um, now I'm just thinking of like my favorite interviews. Um, gosh, those two. It's, it's, those two. They yeah. do a lot, like over the years, they definitely meld together. Well, I will say this. Um, when I first started, it was like, obviously, I didn't know what I was doing at all. And I didn't go to journalism school. Like I said, I was an actor. I trained at American Musical and Dramatic Academy. I was a theater actor. I didn't know anything like about being on TV and that kind of stuff. And so I've just been kind of making my way, you know, as I go. And so uh, when, when I first got started, I got to interview Kevin Bacon. And oh, wow. I just was like, I don't even know what to say. And, and like the only, like I used to get teased in school. Um, they would say that Kevin Bacon was my boyfriend because my name is Lonita <laughs> Cook. And so they'd be like, Lonita Cook, Kevin Bacon. Like, <laughs> 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 and so when I got to interview him, that's like going in my head. <laughs> oh, wow. I was like, he does not want to know. Oh, that yeah. That, that, but but that, however, that would make a really good first impression and like a standout <laughs> moment that he could have gone on to like Ellen or something or like so, or somewhere like that. He didn't have to share that conversation. <laughs> well, if I ever get to talk to him again, maybe I'll tell them. Then. <laughs> but he was really great um, to talk to. And it was the interview that I did that really put me at ease and made me feel like, okay, um, I kind of understand what I can be doing here. Um, and so that that's one of those early interviews that really stood out for me. Um, yeah, yeah. I I mean it's so many it's so many great I cherish every interview I get to do with the celebrities, but then like folks, you know, indie filmmakers, folks back home. My um very first interview um where somebody was like, You're good at this, you should be doing this. Um, that made me feel that way. Um, Michelle Davidson, do you know who she is? The name rings the bell. So I, the reason the name rings a bell is because she co-hosted Kansas City Live with Michael Mackey um, on, cha on Channel 41. And um, I was n not on TV, um, at the on, on live TV. I was hosting a show for um, Kansas City, Kansas Community College. And I started a column reviewing movies. And she asked if I would review her short film. 
it was her first movie that she had made. And um, if I would interview her and after our interview, she said, this was the funnest interview I ever had. And I, that's something that I've never forgotten. It gave me such a sense of confidence. Um, and then she's the one who got me into live television. She asked if I would be the film critic for Kansas City Live. And so um, I always credit her as a highlight, uh, uh, an important person in the elevation of my own career and, and what I thought I was able to do or capable of. I always credit her as somebody who said, hey, you can do more, you can do this, you can, you know, <laughs> so, yeah. All righty, um, we gotta bring, since we're talking about him, we gotta bring him back in. So recently teamed up with our good friend, Michael Mackey, to co-create, co-executive produce, and co-host, I got to say, one of the best travel series I have seen in a long time for PBS travel series, Get Lost. So what has been some of the feedback that you two have received about the show? And where do you and Michael hope to take Get Lost to the next level? Thank you. Thank you for this. Thank you for this wonderful question. And thank you for um, that incredible compliment. Um, <laughs> that's so cool. Um, well... Some of the feedback that we've gotten is that we, um, people want to see us talking to people in the community more. Um, and I would agree. Um, they want to see us kind of walking through the communities. They want to see the towns that we're in. Um, in our pilot episode, um, we kind of did the the locations, like the places you need to visit when you get to this town. But people asked for us to kind of walk through the town. They want to experience uh, the city with us. And so that's one thing that um, we had heard. Um, they, I, I've heard like, Michael and I both have big personalities. I'm, I'm a little bit more reserved than Michael. Um, but we both have big personalities. And so getting the note that they, that they want to see more of us um, was kind of like, hmm, really? <laughs> um, but I think what they, what they meant is that um, Michael and I, um, we get along well, we have a lot of fun, but they want to see the, our human side a little bit more. And so that's been some of the really, and that's the kind of feedback that I enjoy, that I like, but, you know, we've gotten compliments okay you know hand over fist is <laughs> like um people are you know like um they didn't know this about disney they didn't know disney was from chicago or lived in marceline and then some people didn't know that he lived in kansas city like um and so just the information we we did a lot of research and then we brought in great people who are experts on topics and so um, that was one thing that we heard a lot is that people learned something. Um, a lot of people felt that we highlighted places really well. So even though some people wanted us to go through, a lot of people were like, hmm, I want to go to Hamilton because I didn't know the J.C. Penney Museum was there and I want to see it. And so that's one thing that... Um, that we've heard is that people um, are finding new places where they want to travel and they want to go to, but that feel like places they can hop in their car and hit the open road and just head there. Um, because what I think separates our show is, because I like travel shows, but the ones that I watch are pretty swanky. You know, they're eating like gold flakes in their meal kind of stuff. Well, with us, we're just going to people's backyards. Like we're going into small towns and we're saying, hey, can I take a peek and see what's going on here? Um, and, and so I think that's, that's kind of one great thing that people are responding to. And that's amazing. I'm so glad for that. I'm very excited to see what you guys have been in store for next seat for as you guys continue, because the thing is, I could see this show helping the Kansas City and Missouri metro areas so much. And like, maybe we have people from Tulsa, maybe we get from Denver and Boulder, Omaha or St. Louis come here, or even Nashville. Yes. Well, so the vision for the show, because Michael and I, the thing, one of the reasons, I mean, he keeps saying in interviews that we don't have anything in common. 
And I'm like, mm, I see us differently. The reason why we work um, is we have different personalities, but we are both big vision, big dreamer types. And so when we get in a room together, we're like, ooh, 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 we could do this. Ooh, and we can do that. And we're just building energy and a vibe with each other. And so our original vision included being able to go to further out, go to Omaha, going to Iowa, going to Colorado, going to Oklahoma, and, and having a regional travel show until uh, people want to come along and take us national, do it, do what needs to be done to get us national. And because we would love to see this great nation. And then once we've been everywhere by open road that we can go here, then we'll have to hop on a plane. <laughs> absolutely, so. absolutely. And I definitely, and this guys, the show is phenomenal. This pilot, why I cannot stop praising the pilot. I, you know, you've seen a lot of the social media's love I've sent you guys. Yes, you, you have been so supportive, like I, and then getting to sit next to you. So I, I know I'm supposed to be talking about myself. I'm not super, super great at that. I'm working on it, but you and I sat next to each other. We went to Disney 100 at um, Union Station. It's an exhibit and you and I, they, were, they did this really wonderful presentation for us where the CEO came out and they talked about all of the great things, the inception of, of the exhibit, where it will go next, you know, um, Disney's relationship to our community and just being able to sit next to you and enjoy that and experience it. And we took pictures together. It's just wonderful. Yeah. I agree. That was one of the most funnest nights ever. I got to say, and that was a really good presentation. You and I were exactly talking when you were bringing when the Harlem Men's Chorus came out and did a huge Disney medley and it really, and seeing all the films in the background, it reminded me so much of my childhood, especially like the Disney films from the later end of the Disney Renaissance, like quasi like the Hunchback Notre Dame and Mulan and Hercules and Tarzan that rarely get their love. It was great seeing that, like getting those, and getting those chills moments. And by the way, guys, Disney, if you are into, if you are go to Kansas City and up until November 30th to see this magical exhibit is probably one of the best exhibits I have ever seen. Yeah, I would agree. There, I mean, there are some things in there that are interactive that were surprising. Um, there, there are some things that they're doing this kind of pushing technology forward or using lesser known technology in a way that elevates Disney. And it was just like so cool. Um, it is appropriate for the entire family. And when you have a legacy that spans a hundred years, everybody's childhood is represented in this room, in the exhibit, in the experience. And so, yeah, I, if you get the chance to go, do it. If you, if you have the opportunity and you're like, oh, we can go to dinner or we could go to the exhibit, go to the exhibit. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> All righty. So, Lenita, we got to start winding down our conversation. So where can our aud where can my audience find you, find Get Lost? And also, also, if you have any books or any readings, where can they find them? Thank you so much, Jacob. Um, first and foremost, before we get out of here, I got to thank you again. I got to thank your viewers and listeners. Um, it, this has been a wonderful conversation. Um, and if you want to hang out with me a little bit more, you can find me at Lonita Cook on Instagram. Um, you can also go to lonitacook.com and then you'll find more about what I do um, I, I'm a middle-aged woman who just got started in pursuing my, my creative dreams. And I work with other folks um, to help them do the same. Um, and so lonitacook.com, you can you know sign up for all the things. Uh, I, I will uh, also be launching a podcast where uh, I talk to midlife high flyers, folks who are uh, starting what I just said, starting their wildest and best dreams in midlife or later. Um, but then also folks like you, Jacob, who are influencers to come on and talk about building influence, building networks and those sorts of things. And that's called Cookies High Flyer Podcast. Uh, and then on YouTube, Lonita Cook, 1221. Awesome. So guys, have you missed an episode of the Jake's Take with Jacob L.A. Show podcast? Visit our channels on Amazon Music, Apple Podcasts, iHeartRadio, 
Podchaser, Spotify, and Spreaker. It's Jake Stick with Jacob Ayashar. J-A-C-O-B-E-L-Y-A-C-H-A-R. Now, are you on social media? Because I'm on social media too. Facebook, Instagram, Threads, Twitter, TikTok, and YouTube. Jacob Ayashar, J-A-C-O-B. E L Y A C H A R and guys want to know who what's going on with AGT this season? Who won Mass Singer? Want to know more? See my interview with Michael Mackey and also more about the Sissy Hunter exhibit that we've been talking about. Head to jakesashcake.com once again, jakesashcake.com. Lanita, it was such a privilege to talk with you. I had a great time talking with you, and we got to do this again soon. And maybe we might bring in Michael. Yes, anytime you say the word, and I'm there. Awesome, guys. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you so much for listening. Until next time, have a great one, everybody. Goodbye.